Well, we are looking for a good shepherd. As someone put it, the nominating committee's description of what we're looking for in the next bishop is something only Jesus himself could really live up to. I suppose that's probably true, but uh, I don't know that I would really want it any other way. I mean, we're looking for someone to show us Jesus, and in a sense to be Jesus among us, to watch over us and guide us as a shepherd caring for his flock. Today is often been called Good Shepherd Sunday, and that image of the shepherd which Jesus uses to describe himself has a very long history behind it in Judaism and outside in the pagan world. In the ancient Near East, in royal inscriptions that we find in Sumer and Babylon and Assyria, the king in whose lands uh, refers to himself as the shepherd instituted by God. In ancient Israel, the judges, before they had kings, they were described as shepherds of the tribes. David, of course, was called by God from tending the sheep. I mean, literally, when the prophet went out there to anoint him king, he said, where's the other one? And his dad said, well, he's out with the flock. Let me go get him. So he was called as literally a shepherd to be the divinely appointed shepherd king of God's people. And interestingly, he's the only king of Israel called a shepherd in the Old Testament. Of course, shepherds were providers and guides and protectors and constant companions of the sheep. They were also figures of authority and leadership for the flock. And so it's no wonder that this pastoral image would be employed for kings and rulers. In contrast with an unjust king who exploits his people, the description of shepherd implies that caring for the weak in society is a particular task of the righteous king. Now before we pick up our reading today, earlier on in John chapter 10, Jesus had contrasted the bad shepherd, or hireling, with a good shepherd. And of course he says that he is the good shepherd. The hired hand abandons the sheep when he sees the wolf coming. But the good shepherd is willing even to die to protect his flock. And then when we get down to our gospel selection for today, John gives us some more context of where this discussion is taking place. He notes it was the feast of the dedication at Jerusalem in winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. And so John is telling us it's Hanukkah, the festival of lights, the last great of the Jewish festivals. It came out of a time of great ordeal and heroism in Jewish history chronicled in the two books of the Maccabees in the Old Testament. The ruler of the Seleucid Empire named Antiochus Epiphanes saw himself as the divine successor to the Greek Empire of Alexander. And so he intervened in Palestine through Hellenizing Jews to promote Greek thought and ways and to eliminate Jewish opposition. And this Hellenizing movement eventually included replacing Jewish religion entirely. At first, it was kind of a peaceful movement, but became violent as opposition and resistance arose. Some of the Jews enthusiastically welcomed the new Greek ways, but most wanted to remain stubbornly loyal to their ancestral ways. They remained faithful. In the year 170 BC, Antiochus attacked Jerusalem, and he looted the temple and the treasury. As many as 80,000 Jews died, and just as many were sold into slavery. It became a capital offense even to possess a copy of the Bible. Circumcision was outlawed, and mothers who circumcised their baby boys were crucified, with the children hanging from their necks. The temple courts were profaned, its chambers turned into brothels, The last straw was when Antiochus had the great temple altar adorned with a statue of the Greek god Zeus and then proceeded to sacrifice a pig upon it. Not exactly gregarious. Antiochus was the thief who had entered into the pasture to steal, to kill, and to to destroy. 
The Hellenized Jews had seen the wolf coming, and they had fled like hired hands. But brave and faithful shepherds, like the priest and martyr Mattathias, and his son Judas Maccabeus, and his other sons, had risen up to protect the flock as good shepherds to defeat Antiochus Epiphanes and restore Jewish freedom as a nation. In 164, the Jews reclaimed their freedom and reclaimed their temple and restored it and rededicated it. There was only one cruise of oil left undefiled, only enough oil to light the great candelabra in the purified and rededicated temple for one day. But miraculously, it stayed lit for eight days, that is, until fresh oil could be prepared according to the ancient formula. Of course, let us pause at that observation and remember that the eighth day in the Christian tradition is the day after the Sabbath, the Lord's day, the day of the resurrection, when God's light returned to the temple of his body and the risen Christ shone as the light of the world. That's why we have this candle here right behind me. So this is the context. The people are remembering their freedom and the light come back into the temple. That they have freedom to worship, freedom to obey God's will, and freedom to let his light shine. And in this context, the people are crowding around Jesus in the temple, saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? Why don't you tell us? Are you the Christ? Jesus said he already told them very plainly, and he, in fact, just did describe himself as the good shepherd, not too much unlike those Maccabean shepherds. And even though every one of his deeds was a proclamation that the Messiah had come, many of them did not believe in Jesus because they didn't want to. At the beginning of the 20th century, a, a fox terrier named Nipper became probably the most famous dog in the world. He was found as a stray in Bristol, England in 1884, and he was named Nipper because he liked to bite at people's ankles. And an artist named Francis Baraud adopted the dog, and he noticed that one day how the dog loved to come sit and listen to the record player. And since he found it to just kind of be an amusing sight, he painted a picture of it. And years later, he sold the rights to that image to a company that made record players. And so from this, the Radio Corporation of America, or RCA, created their logo. The figure of a dog sitting before a gramophone, staring up in wonder. And the caption told it all. His master's voice. It had recorded it so exactly. And this logo relied on people's knowledge of dogs and their relationship with their owners, how it's so unique you know, the animal will begin to wag its tail and squirm and eagerly jump and when the master calls. But not necessarily so for just any old voice. And Jesus used a similar reality in trying to explain his relationship with his disciples. You don't believe because you don't belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. One of the great dangers for disciples is not recognizing Jesus in our lives, like sheep, not hearing the voice of the shepherd. It's very easy for us, of course, to fail to discern his will when we can't separate his voice from the other many voices and distractions clamoring for our attention. So we have to want to listen, and we have to practice listening and learn to recognize his voice. We must keep our ears intentionally tuned to the voice of the Lord as our good shepherd calling out in the midst of other voices. If we cannot recognize his voice, it's because we're not a part of his flock. And if we're not part of Jesus' flock, we don't belong to him, then we won't walk through life under his guide and care. And there are great blessings for having the Lord as our shepherd. I give them eternal life, he says, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. And so we find here a threefold blessing 
of being sheep in the Lord's flock. The first we might easily skip over is the blessing of a personal relationship with Jesus. That in itself is a great blessing. Personal access. I know them. They know me. I speak. They hear my voice. Now you can't just call up the President of the United States or the Governor or even the Mayor and get, to, get a chance for a chat. But you do have a direct line to the Lord of the entire universe. And he likes it that way. He likes to take your call. And he cares for you as an individual. The second blessing is that gift of eternal life. Jesus is not like the hired hand who runs away from the sheep when the wolf comes and death approaches. He puts the sheep first. He lays down his life for the sheep. And eternal life is not just everlasting, a life that doesn't end. It's a life that comes from eternity. God's life that comes from outside of his creature of time. And he shares that with us. God's life that overcomes the wolf of death. He doesn't have to share it. He wills to share it with his sheep. As we heard from John's revelation, salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. And then that third blessing for Christ's flock is eternal security. That no matter how fearful the wolves of life may seem, they will never be any match for the good shepherd. God holds you secure in the palm of his hand. He will never forsake you or let you go. Eternal security, eternal life, and a personal relationship with our shepherd. It's good to be a sheep. And God will give us a good shepherd, a bishop to walk among us in the Lord's stead. So then let us train our ears to be willing to listen to his voice and follow where he leads. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.